Right, so I don't know why, but I just decided to talk about philosophy of science in five minutes. I guess the idea is that we're supposed to be stepping back from the day-to-day -day work and just thinking about what we do in the round, and it's kind of, if you like, meta-science, what, what is science all about. Um, I'm not particularly well qualified to talk about this, uh, and I put up a little quotation there for Cristalla to translate for people um, to explain my credentials. What does it mean? <laughs> it's supposed to say, I know that I know nothing. Yeah, that's what Socrates said, um, and that's one of the beginnings of philosophy that we don't actually know very much at all for certain. Um, and then there's this, I don't know why we can't get rid of this. Um, let's put them out of the way down there. And then go back. The question is, what is the philosophy of science for? Uh, Richard Feynman pointed out that actually... You know, philosophy of science is about as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. Um, I guess some of the, his kind of critique there is this issue of, is philosophy of science supposed to be normative or descriptive? Is it supposed to tell us as scientists how we're supposed to be doing science? Or is it just the philosophers describing what we do and picking apart what we do and, and, and so forth? And there is some, some tension there, I think, in between those two kind of goals of philosophy of science. So science is about trying to get knowledge, truth about the world. Um, and in many cases, people would say, well, it's about the real world out there, and it's finding out things that are independent of us, and that's what we're supposed to be finding out about. That's one view of science, and often termed realism, or scientific realism, that there is a real world out there, and we can find out about it. There's another view which says, well, actually, science is just a kind of, kind of heuristic. It's a kind of practical approach that seems to work and it solves problems for us, but we don't care about truth and knowledge, we just care about its instrumental value, and that's, that's given the term instrumentalism, and that, that knowledge has got instrumental value, it's useful to us, but it doesn't have any intrinsic value, and, and, and at its extreme, this view would say, well, actually, scientific theories don't have any truth value, it's not true or false to say that electrons exist or don't exist, um, it's just useful to think about electrons uh, as entities and, and see where that takes you, or photons, or, or whatever. Science actually started uh, here in the UK, you could argue, um, with Francis Bacon laid down the foundations of scientific method. Um, as we're into that Oxford Cambridge man, to point out he was a Cambridge man, um, and he's buried in Trinity College Chapel. Um, and that's why when you get a degree from Cambridge, it's a BA, because the actual university predates the establishment of science. But this guy actually laid down the foundations. He said, well, you should first go and collect what he called the first vintage data uh, without prior explanation in mind. And that touches on what Charles said earlier, which is making observations sometimes raises questions. At the time that Bacon was doing this, they just recovering from a sort of cycle of religious wars, um, and he was keen to try and be objective. His idea was that there shouldn't be a Protestant science or a Catholic science, there should just be science, and that you should just go out there and see what's out there without any uh, presuppositions. And then the idea was that you can iteratively test those theories and refine your theories from the evidence provided by your senses. So in that sense, it's, it's what they call an empirical approach. And the aim was to, from all those observations out there, to arrive at some kind of general truth. And also Bacon uh, quite cleverly realised that there were certain ways in which we trick ourselves. Um, he called them the idols of the mind. I think nowadays you'd call them cognitive bias. But there were ways in which you can trick yourself and you have to try and avoid falling into those traps. Now early on in science, there was this idea about hypotheses. Um, and you know, observational science, even to today, people say, well, if you just do lots of observations, it's just a fishing expedition, and it's, it's not the way you're supposed to do science. The alternative view is, well, it's a necessary precursor to collect all that information to generate hypotheses. And it's interesting that there's this famous phrase from Isaac Newton where he says, hypotheses known thingo, uh, which means I do not feign hypotheses. Now, there's some subtlety in there. It's probably he's not probably not saying he doesn't 
ever have hypotheses like we believe in hypotheses today. What he was trying to say was that it was more like instrumentalism, that he could explain things by his laws of motion or by the equations that he used to describe gravity, but he couldn't really hypothesize as what an ac action at a distance really was. What was the real thing underneath it? Um, and he, he just said, look, I don't know what gravity is, uh, or I don't know what momentum is, but these concepts actually are useful. Um, and so this idea of you know, issues about hypotheses kind of is it still a dynamic issue. Now, one of the, the key, clear points about this empirical approach of science is it's based on induction. If we're looking at the logical basis of what we know, you can divide what you know into two kinds of ways of knowing. There's deductive logic, which drastically, here's a drastically oversimplified version of that, which is all A are B, X is an A, therefore X is a B. That has to be true by the laws of thought, by the laws of logic. So that's deductive logic. And, and, and mathematics, in a sense, is a branch of deductive logic where you can actually prove things. And once you've proved them, that's it, they're absolutely true and nobody can doubt them ever again. Um, what we use in, in, in science is, is inductive logic where you would say things like all the copper we've tested conducted as electricity, X is a piece of copper yet to be tested, therefore X will conduct electricity. That's the sort of reasoning we, we engage in. Now, there are problems. Uh, the problems of this kind of inductive reasoning are generally attributed the problem of deduction to, to David Hume, who, oh great, thank you, uh, who, who said that um, it's unsafe to generalise about the properties of a class of objects based on lots of observations of particular instances of that class. And the classic one that all philosophers say is that up until, I don't know when it was, the 19th century, we have all said all swans we have ever seen are white, and therefore all swans are white. And you go to Australia, and you find there are some black swans. And so this belief that you had up till then, based on induction, that all swans were white, turns out not to be true. Hume also pointed out that presupposing that the sequence of events in the future will occur as it's always done in the past, what he called the principle of uniformity of nature, is on very dodgy ground as well. Um, and you know, you, you, whenever you buy any... Uh, Financial product, they'll always tell you, you know, uh, you know, the value of this can go up and down, and the past is no future to, to uh, the eye to the future. Bertrand Russell made the point, you know, that uh, you can, that as far as the chicken's concerned, its owner comes and feeds it and is nice to it every day until the day that he wrings its neck and kills it. Um, and, and, you know, as he says, it might be better to have a more refined view of the uniformity of nature if you're a chicken um, and you might run away. Um, and Hume pointed out that you can't actually say, well, induction works because we've always used induction in the past and it's always been true because that's a circular argument and if you can't get around that issue. And Hume basically concluded that we just have to accept induction as an instinct. We open your eyes and look around the world. You cannot think any other way. Um, and we just have to accept that it's a very dodgy kind of basis for knowledge, but that's the way it is. Um, in fact, more recently, people have kind of added explanation into induction. So it's not just about saying, well, we see these patterns of behavior, therefore we can predict what will happen in the future. But we also like to explain. We have to come up with some explanation. And there's this kind of reasoning called abduction now, which is often uh, referred to as uh, inference to the best explanation, which is basically using induction and trying to have some explanation. Now, why, why is that important? Well, actually, one of the problems of induction also is that there may be many different explanations for the same events in front of you. So you might come home um, and discover uh, your wife's underpants on the floor, a knickers on the floor, um, and you might think that she's been having an affair. Uh, and that she's, you know, been in the be bedroom that afternoon with, with a lover, or it may be that she felt unwell and, 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 and was sick and changed her clothes, or any kind of number of explanations can account for that, for what you've seen, okay? And so 
how do you select the best hypothesis among many? Uh, and the one that, that you can look at is one that explains what's in front of you, um, but also explains the most with the least. And there's this idea of parsimony or elegance in science. So going back to Occam's razor, William of Occam, and Genosum, Multiplicanda Praeter Necessitatum, which means you don't, shouldn't multiply the number of things you need to explain something beyond necessity. Um, this idea of elegance, beauty is, is truth, truth, beauty can keep, or Whitehead, associate of Bertrand Russell, said seek simplicity and just trust it. Einstein said raffinate is the hair got other boars after the same nick, which means uh, God is subtle but he's not malicious. Um, and um, so this is this uh, issue of, of trying to find uh, causal explanations as well as using induction. Uh, there's a nice quote there from Dawkins on Darwin. He said that never were so many facts explained by so few assumptions. I'm talking about the elegance of Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, and one of Darwin's contemporaries, a guy called Hewell, came up with this word consilience to, do, to talk about the way in which different kinds of evidence from different sources can come together to actually provide evidence and explanation uh, for, for uh, something. Does anyone know who this is? This was an interesting movement in the early 20th century. This is Freddie Eyre, A.J. Eyre. He wrote a classic of philosophy called Language, Truth and Logic. And he was looking at this issue of how do we actually know anything? Uh, and what does it mean to know anything? And he, he came up with this thing called the verification principle, which was that if you make a statement about the world, if you cannot actually find a way in which that statement could be verified, then it's actually meaningless. And it's just, it's not that it's not true, it's just a stupid, meaningless thing to say. So the classic thing was that you can't prove God exists, and actually, therefore, talking about God is meaningless in this uh, viewpoint of logical positivism. Um, you know, Dawkins now says that why, why do we have departments of theology in universities when there's no God, there's nothing for them to study? Uh, it's a kind of logical uh, progression from that view. Now that view was held for a short while in the early 20th century in the English-speaking world, uh, but um, it was superseded by another view, which I'll talk about in a moment. But it's worth just spending two minutes more on A.J. Eyre, because he did one thing that's particularly notable, uh, one particular anecdote, which is that he was at, in his later life, he actually went to a party, and Naomi Campbell was at the party, um, and Mike Tyson. And he happened to notice that Mike Tyson was giving Naomi Campbell a bad, a hard time, harassing her. So he intervened and said, look, just give the lady a break, will you? And Mike Tyson said, don't you know who I am? I'm the heavyweight champion of the world, the boxing champion of the world. And Freddie Ayer is supposed to have said, well, I am the former Wickham professor of logic um, at Oxford. We're both preeminent in our field. Can we not discuss this like rational men? And it's kind of... The idea that you go up to Mike Tyson and say that, it's just classic. But it's supposed to have worked. I think Mike Tyson did stop harassing Naomi Campbell. Anyway, uh, it was one of his contemporaries, Karl Popper, that said, well, actually, verification is not the issue. Because you can't actually prove a theory because of this issue of induction. You know, swans are white. You can't keep looking at swans and prove it. But there's this asymmetry. You can easily disprove it or falsify it by saying, oh, here's a swan that's black. Um, and so he, he articulated the fact that there was this total asymmetry there um, and that you have to um, look at that issue, the, the falsifiability of, of a theory or of a statement or whatever. Um, and so instead of it being verifiability, the, the hallmark of, uh, for Popper of scientific theories was that they should be falsifiable. And this divided science from pseudoscience. So there might be things that look a bit like science, but in fact they make claims that can never be falsified and therefore they're just effectively meaningless. And in a sense, uh, well, Popper actually made the point that this is a kind of Darwinian process for theories. It's survival of the, of the fittest for scientific theories. So you, you try and falsify, you try and falsify, you try and falsify, and the longer you try and the harder you try, the, the, the stronger that theory becomes. But it also emphasises the provisional nature of scientific truth because we always have to accept that kind of black swan event might happen, that this th theory and this framework we've been working with for years, decades, centuries, suddenly something comes along and it's not quite so much true. 
Um, so if you if you take a hypothesis, I mean, often this is the way to divide now that, that you have a hypothesis about something. If you battle test it in this Popperian sense, and you have some explanatory framework within it as well, then it becomes a theory. So we have the theory of evolution or atomic theory, um, and, and such like. One one uh, one of the last things to say is that. Uh, we also have Thomas Kuhn here, 25 years ago, this year, that actually wrote a, a famous work, the, uh, the, the Structure of Scientific uh, Theories, where he actually pointed out that we have this kind of normal science where we just keep moving a little bit forward, we refine our theories and hypotheses a little bit, and we collect information and so forth. But every now and then, one of those theories does start to really strain under the weight of challenging data, and there's all these things that don't quite fit. Suddenly there's this kind of sudden shift to an explanatory framework, which he called a paradigm shift. In, in a sense, it's kind of an abductive earthquake, if you like, that, that just everything just moves about in your conceptual view, and you come up with a completely new framework. And there are various examples of that in the past, you know, the idea that the Earth went around the sun, uh, the idea of evolution as an explanation. Plate tectonics is a more modern one, and, and, and quantum mechanics. In, in biology, one of the most interesting ones was this chemiosmotic theory uh, by a guy called Peter Mitchell, who was a, a bit of a maverick. Who had, I think he was one of the last gentleman scientists who managed to bankroll his own lab out in the West Country somewhere. And he came up with this idea um, that um, basically the, the movement of protons was actually what was uh, responsible for the, the creation of ATP. Um, and he, he, he's supposed to have kept a board in his house where all of his opponent's names are on there and one after another they finally were convinced that he was right and he would cross their name off the board until he finally got to the last one and sort of died a happy man that he managed to convince the rest of the world of this pattern of that paradigm shift. There are lots of fruitless arguments in science and in the philosophy of science. Um, you know, uh, coming back to what we were saying earlier, this idea about is science about hypothesis testing? And I think Popper's got a lot to answer for because there's a lot of people now who sort of really bang on about, oh, you've got to state a hypothesis. Well, you know, the Baconian view was that no, you, you actually go and collect the data first and refine it and then create hypotheses from your observations. You don't have to always go in with a hypothesis in mind. And it's, you know, there, is, there are parts of science that are a bit like cartography. You, know, you want to go and map Australia, you just go and map it. Or you want to map the dark side of the moon. It's the same kind of thing. And, of course, there's this other problem about reductionism, which seems to work very well, actually, that you study things in isolation and you get some good explanations out of it. Whereas there is this modern view from some people which says that all biology is systems biology. Unless you're thinking at a systems level and holistically, then you're not doing biology correctly. There's a quote there also from Rutherford about, um, you know, is, is, is science explanatory in the way of physics is, or is it just stamp collecting? You know, just naming another bird species from the Amazon, that's just stamp collecting. Or sequencing another genome. Uh, we said that, you know, science is fallible. In fact, there are arguments to say that most science is wrong. And there's this paper that came out... It's in uh, one of the PLOS journals recently saying that why most published research findings are false. I'll put it in the drop box for you to read if you want to read it. Basically, most of what people say is, is untrue. Uh, and so we just have to accept that, if you like, science has got feet of clay. Uh, and if you really, really want certainties, then you'd have to come, become a logician or a mathematician. That's it.